Chris Landry, I hope you're having a great day, sir. Welcome into the game in Tuscaloosa. I'm doing well, Ryan. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, so, yeah, very very well. We're spending a lot of time looking back at LSU, and I'd love to get your thoughts before we move forward to, to Mississippi State. What do you think about LSU and Alabama? Well, it's in some ways typical of how that game is played out. I was, you know, um, not surprised, but I thought there were some uh, missed opportunities for Alabama in the game. I thought they left some plays out in the field. Um, number drop balls, breaking down the tape. I thought there were some some big plays to be made in the passing game, some drives that could have been sustained better. And, you know, it's like in most games when you break it down, you look at it and, and there's a play here, there's a play there. And the game could have been completely different had that taken place. Now, I think LSU left some plays out in the field too. But I think that um, I, I thought they really had some opportunities in the passing game and they made some really good throws. And um, just uh, the, the the play overall of the receiving core, uh, while they made some plays, they left some plays on the field is the best way I would describe it. Defensively, um, they did a really good job. Um, you know, the whole eye candy, jet sweep stuff that are a part of everything that LSU does on every play by design, either fake or run it, um, that, that did nothing against Alabama. They had one misplay there where they're completely misaligned, and that led to the Darrell Williams big run or else, um, you know, and it set up that score there. But it uh, was not Alabama's best performance by any stretch. Um, yeah, I mean, it was if you break down the tape and if you watch the game objectively, Alabama was never really threatened. I mean, LSU was never in a position to really threaten them. And I think we've kind of gotten to the point now where people, if they don't beat, if Alabama doesn't beat people by 40, then something's wrong with them. And it's almost like a a loss, if you will. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes that's very dangerous to get into. Chris, let me ask you about this offensive line. What did LSU do on that front that gave this offensive line so much trouble? Uh, they're just they're athletic. They've got a little better front than most people think, and it is something to look forward to. Um, you know, going forward um, with Auburn and Georgia potentially, um, uh, that those are two defensive lines that are the equal or better than LSU's. L- they're deeper than LSU's, but LSU's got speed. Arden Key is. Very difficult. He's the next level player that is very difficult to block one on one. Uh, the quickness, the speed, um, the, the really caused Alabama some trouble there, and 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 yield some penetration that I thought Jalen Hurts got him out of some trouble. I mean, if you're dropping back with a pocket passer, there's more negative plays there. Uh, Alabama avoided some negative plays by the athleticism of Jalen Hurts, which is kind of you know, why they've kind of gone to that is, um, you know, one play early in particular, I mean, it's a big time loss and he turns it into a, a first down uh, conversion. So um, that that's that's the biggest issue. The LSU's got really good speed. They're not as deep, but they've got really good speed. Richard Lawrence is a horse. They've got a couple of young guys that are playing well, Arden Key. Um, that, that's a different caliber group than they faced us for this year, and they're going to face a good group, a good defensive front in Auburn, uh, and again, potentially Georgia. Chris, let me go to these linebacker situations here in Tuscaloosa. You mm-hmm. lose two more on Saturday with Mac Wilson and Sean Deon Hamilton. Uh, it's it's like they're going to backups to backups to backups. Uh, certainly, they're going to rotate Keith Holcomb, which got some playing time for Sean Evans, uh, but losing two guys like Mac Wilson and Sean Deon Hamilton just adds to the injury problem that's been on the defensive side of the football. Well, it does. There's no question about it. And, you know, the thing about it is you always tell guys is no one's going to feel sorry for you. A lot of people have injuries, and you have to deal with it. Uh, When it comes in waves like that at one position, it's difficult. But, you know, people tend to notice it more when it's their team, and and they don't really care about what happens to somebody else's team, but they're faced with it right now. And – they're in better position than most because they have really good athletes that can come in and they have coaching that is at a next level that can get guys ready to play quicker. And because they're more capable, you can see some impact from them that are going to be more so than other programs. But in a relative sense, it's going to hurt the team. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you can't lose those caliber of players and then 
extract them from it and say they're going to be the same. Now, the result may be the same. I don't think it's going to threaten them um, in terms of losing to, say, this week against Mississippi State. I don't think that's the issue, and that's what most people look at is they only care about the result. Well, you know, the process that, that generates the results is going to be a lot, lot much more uh, complicated, and uh, I think that there's uh, there's potential there to for people to exploit uh, in the process more so than it's been in the past. You've got a uh, actually some of the articles there, LandryFootball.com. You've got the Alabama f- uh, Film Room Review. Alabama must find replacements following the more linebacker injuries. Chris, what do you do as far as Jeremy Pruitt and Nick Saban? Do you try to keep the same schemes? Do you try to break it down to the basics? Do you? How do you work these guys back into the conversation if you've got younger, inexperienced players and you're trying to ask them to play big-time roles for this football team? Well, you don't change the scheme. Obviously, you, the scheme is what they've been brought up in, and they've practiced for a reason and gotten a lot of reps for a reason so that they can be prepared to come in. What you have to adjust a little bit is maybe some of the things you do in terms of adjustments, uh, in terms of being able to simplify things for guys that are not as experienced um, that's what you try to do. You try to siphon it down a little bit. But, you know, I don't think you, you do it a great deal. You're, again, as you get more reps, you're going to see a guy like a Dylan Moses, uh, Moses that's going to step up. And Dylan Moses is going to be a player. He's going to be another next-level player. He's going to be one of the next really good players. And quite frankly, this is going to only speed up that process from him being a factor. Um, but, you know, ideally he's got guys ahead of him, and that's why – um, he's not played as much, but he's made a lot of progress, I know, in practice that's gotten him a lot better. Now, uh, understanding what they're doing, how they're doing it, they put a lot of pressure on these guys to learn and study a lot. So while I think there is certainly um, a loss is significant, I would classify it as, again, it's not like they're just completely lost and turning around, throwing their hands up and saying, what are they going to do? That's why they recruit so well, and that's why they really work hard to develop young guys. And if you've noticed some of these guys, and I don't know how many people have, but in some of these blog games, you're seeing some of these reps with some of these guys, that's why they coach the dog on hard when they're up by 40 points. They're sitting there making sure they don't care about what the score is at that point. They're trying to get a guy to do it right, an assignment, technique, discipline of being correct on a consistent basis. That's why they do all that, because now they're going to have to line up and they, where the games are 0-0, zero, zero, and they're going to have to make plays and keep teams out of the red zone, out of the end zone. Um, they're going to have to perform. So that's why they really train it the way they do. And so, again, I think they're in, they're in better shape than most people are. And, and as I said, no one's going to feel sorry for them, and no one's going to say, oh, boy, they, they, they're, they're going to come after and attack them. Uh, I think that's going to be interesting to see how they do it, because – Defending the run, I think, is where they've got a better fit. I think that they're a little bit more advanced, these young guys, in terms of understanding their run fits. I think the passing game could be a little bit more iffy because it's a little bit more timing and a little bit more assignment-oriented. And so that's something to watch, see who can exploit it. I don't know that Mississippi State can. I don't I don't know that, that we'll see teams be effectively – able to attack that but that is something to look forward to and to see how they uh, how they respond in the passing game in particular Chris I know a lot of things are made from the sidelines we talk about calling the game but you do lose your defensive signal caller in Sean Deanna Hamilton yep. uh, how does that affect it and and who do you see maybe a guy like Rashawn Evans taking that role or, or what do you see yeah no absolutely and and that's how you do it too you cross cross train guys because you recognize at any point that the guy calling your signal can go down, and so who's going to be the next guy? And one of the things that you always want to try to do with linebackers is cross-train them so that they, um, you know, the ability, even if you're an outside backer, to be able to play the inside backer position in some uh, practice settings, which is something that I know that Nick learned, I learned from Bill Belichick. That's what Bill does. Bill, it doesn't matter if you're a weak backer or a Sam backer, you're going to you're going to play inside backer first because you're going to learn how to call it and you're going to understand the defense from the inside before you go outside. And the reason is that you need to be able to call it. So that's what Nick does as well. And 
So you're going to see, I'm not going to say it's going to be seamless and it's going to be as good, but it's not like somebody going to put on the field that they're totally clueless. Might you have some mistakes that maybe you wouldn't have? Possibly, but it is something that, again, they've kind of prepared for in the event that their signal caller goes down. And, you know, at this stage, I look at it like this as an opportunity for these guys to step in, make some plays, get comfortable. What you worry about a little bit is two things, Ryan. One, no more further injuries at that position where it really start to thin, starts to thin you out. And two, what effect it could possibly have on special teams. Linebackers are important in some of your core special teams units, and you're going to have to really step up and have younger guys, even younger inexperienced guys, maybe even pull off a couple of red shirts on guys that are going to have to be stalwarts on special teams. And that's where you know everyone just kind of, special teams they just kind of look at it you punt and you return and you, you, everybody kind of looks forward to getting the offense and defense back on the field but that is such a pivotal part of the game uh, and the ability to prevent big plays and make big plays are directly correlated to, to having experienced people on that end so that's something we need to look out for as well well the great news is Minka Fitzpatrick is back and and moving that's well huge. In, in practice today they they uh, they were putting up a couple of video clips a couple of minutes ago, and he's catching it one-handed, running down the uh, the field with an interception. So uh, not too bad. It's good news for Alabama fans that Mika Fitzpatrick is out moving around. It it had an effect in that game last week, too, because he really was not in that game. Early he got injured against LSU, and it affected a little bit. And let me just say, throw this out there, too. It is more difficult to adjust to an injury in-game than it does when you have an injury and you've got a week to prepare. Because remember that there's only so many reps that players can get. So that if you're in a reserve role, you're not getting, it's not folks understanding on a board or understanding on paper or in this day and age on a laptop, on an iPad, what to do. It's about walking it through and physically feeling it where it's, it's like somebody telling you to do something on your golf swing. you got to get out there and swing. And when you have limited swings out there on the practice field, it's difficult. So when you come into a game at any position, it is a bigger adjustment to come in where you don't have the benefit of first-team reps. It is a lot easier to come in with a week worth of reps uh, to be prepared. And this is such a a specific to a game plan specific defense that these guys will be taught this week this is what your responsibilities are and it's not like they're going to th- they understand the defense but they're not going to throw everything out at them they're going to say this is what we want you to do and focus on so we want you to be an expert on these three things this week and against this look this is what we want you to focus on in this look these are the things we want you to look for and react to. And if you do that with enough pre- uh, prep work during the week and enough reps, it's a lot more seamless in the adjustment than just having to adjust on the fly in the game because the game plan's already in. Guys have not had the reps, as I said, and it's a tougher adjustment to do on the fly. Chris, and you look at this defensive side of the football, I, I've tried to highlight Jeremy Pruitt because I think it's almost, it, it's almost automatic, right? Nick Saban and Jeremy Pruitt, they're going to work it out. Uh, but you, you look at the job that Jeremy Pruitt's done, I think he's one of the top defensive coordinators in all of college football. If he can make all this work and Alabama can get in the college football playoffs uh, with all these adjustments because of these injuries, he has done a marvelous job here in Tuscaloosa. Well, he's been around the system a long time, as I'm sure most Alabama fans know, and that's that's critical. Um, you know, it's kind of like maybe to some degree, and, and I know like Kirby got a job at Georgia, so he wasn't overlooked, and I think people began to give him a lot of credit. But I think that to some degree people just say, well, whoever you know is coaching the defense uh, at Alabama is, is working under Nick Saban, and he's running his defense, and that is true. But you still have to go out and execute it. And I think the longer you're are in the system and are familiar with it, the more comfortable you are and all the permeations and adjustments and the pockets of adjustments that you have to have and how you teach it and how you're going to call it. 
Um, Jeremy's done that, and he's done that exceedingly well and probably doesn't give enough credit. I think in foot, in the football business he gets a lot of credit. Maybe he doesn't get enough credit publicly, but I think that's like anything, Ryan. It's it, it, We live in a world where, it, you know, the, the people you hear about the most or you see most, don't t- you know, that they uh, people associate with that. Oh, that guy's good. I see him on TV all the time or what have you. Uh, but but uh, that's that's really not reality. The reality in the football world is that Jeremy's done a good job, and the big reason why he's worked so well is that he's worked under this system in a couple of different spots, and in particular in the secondary, he understands how things work. He understands the whole pattern matching system, and then obviously he's got guys on his staff that are very, very familiar with the fronts, and they work very, very well together, and that's that's why I think they've been successful consistently and uh, it's why they really as great a job as Kirby Smart did, Ryan. It, the defense hadn't really missed a beat. It's not like, you know, hey, boy, they're missing something. Uh, it, it's it's not been the case. I think it's always going to be the case where the offensive coach will be under further scrutiny, positively or negatively, because the perception is, well, you know, Nick doesn't fool with that side of the ball, and therefore that offensive guy is really doing more work. That's not true. Nick is very involved as very bit, bit as much involved in the offense, but perception is a little bit different than reality. Chris, do you think Jeremy Pruitt will get some looks with all these vacancies? Yeah, yeah, I think he will. I think that there's a lot of guys that maybe are ahead of him in terms of current head coaches, um, and I think he may need, you know, maybe I don't know that he needs a little more seasoning, um, but it depends upon where he's willing to go and what he's willing to do or what he's willing to wait for. Uh, is he looking for a, you know, a Kirby job, you know, where – yeah, that that worked great. He, Kirby had a chance to go to South Carolina, and then when his alma mater got wind of it, they decided to make a move on Mark Rick, and, and then he ends up there. I think it really depends upon where he wants to go. If he is interested in one of these jobs, we're going to have a lot of openings. I don't. I mean, I don't. Not a, not going to be a candidate out of Florida. I don't think he's going to be a candidate of Tennessee. I think he would be on a on the lo- the long list, not the short list at at an Ole Miss. But, again, as some of those moves take place and some of those people are let go, I mean, would he be interested in going to Central Florida, for example, as I expect Scott Frost to leave? Well, I don't know that. I haven't really spoken to him about it. And, you know, maybe he waits for a bigger job and he stays where he is now, or maybe that intrigues him. I don't know. Um, but he absolutely is someone that I think will be considered by uh, by a number of folks. Chris, do you think Mississippi State can give Alabama some issues, or do you see this game really heavily favoring the Crimson Tide? No, I, I think that I think Mississippi State's a good team, a well-coached team. I think they'll be physical. The problem is Mississippi State, if you study Mississippi State, and I think Dan Mullen's done a phenomenal job there, as the season goes along, their team is not the same. We talk about depth, and we just talk ad nauseum about what Alabama's going through. Mississippi State's Everyone goes through it, maybe not this many players at one position that Alabama's gone through right now. It's been unusual, I know. But Mississippi State, um, it, it, it affects them a lot more as the natural attrition of a season takes place because they're not as deep. The program is not on the same level. So at the line of scrimmage, um, and, I, and I think Mississippi State does a really good job, particularly on the defensive front, it's a good front, but they're not as strong. So they're not, and you look at it, and people might say, "Well, wait a minute! Didn't Mississippi State blow out LSU?" They absolutely did. But Mississippi State doesn't have as much talent as LSU, uh, and they were healthier and fresher at the early part of the season. Now they're not playing quite as well at the line of scrimmage. Good team, good team, but I don't think for four quarters they hold up very well against uh, Alabama unless Alabama's, again, contributing to the cause with turnovers and mistakes. So uh, I think that they will play them well. I think it'll be like, I hesitate to say it, because what I think is a 14-17 point win is good. Some people think, oh, that's, you know, what's wrong? I, I think I think this state team will play them well for a while, but eventually 
into the fourth quarter, that's when it, it starts to separate. If you are that fan that wants to go deeper into college football, the football views from a coach, a scout, an administrator, LandryFootball.com is for you. Go and check it out. They've got a lot of great free information here, uh, but there's also a lot of information that you could go a little bit deeper. They've got the podcast every Tuesday and Thursday. Chris, I'd love to be able to take you to Lee County and sort of give us the thoughts on this Auburn and Georgia game that will be upcoming this weekend. What do you think? Well, I'm going to go back to several weeks ago when I really thought this Auburn team, and we go back to when they were struggling early and, um, you know, certainly against Clemson, and they got kind of the back on track against the likes of Mercer and Missouri. And then, you know, I even mentioned, as you, you asked the question at the time, that they're starting to get better, and this defense is really good, and they're starting to play better on offense. And I think everyone has kind of forgotten about Auburn, after the collapse against LSU, they were dominating LSU at the half, and it cost them. If not, we're talking about Auburn as a one-loss team with Georgia and Alabama. Uh, you know, they're in a position to kind of control their fate the rest of the way. Um, and this is a very good defensive team, very good. And I think they can run the football well. And I think they will give Georgia a, quite a test. And this game I was looking forward to probably as much as anybody this year uh, until the, the LSU-Auburn game kind of spoiled it to some degree. But I do favor Georgia for a couple of reasons. One, I think Georgia is a little bit more balanced with the running game. They've got greater depth at running back. They're healthier. they got four guys that they can run. they got two great ones. They are they're all run blocking better. They've got better, better. Sam Pittman's done a great job, one of the best uh, jobs that I've seen done in college football this year among assistant coaches as the job that Sam Pittman has done with that offensive line has proved greatly. Um, and I think that's going to be pivotal. I do think that Fromm is going to have to make some plays in the passing game, um, and we'll see if he can do it. I think that they have not utilized it a lot. I think they've been risk-averse with their offense, and they might have to challenge a little more. But I trust Georgia a little bit more with how they're able to play call with Jim Cheney. Um, and, I, you know, I think – lost a lot of faith in what Auburn was able to do in that LSU game or didn't do, I look at this Auburn team and say if they play their best game, they're very capable of beating Georgia. But I just wonder, are they going to have enough in the running game? Are they healthy enough? Um, you know, on Johnson, you know, uh, is 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 going to be pivotal here. So how are they going to be able to do it? And will they unleash uh, Jared Stidham? Will he be able to make enough plays? Uh, I think that's that's going to be the key. I, I like Georgia's chances defensively better. I think both defenses have an advantage in this game, but I think Georgia's defense can create more negative plays, and I kind of like the laser, laser focus of this Georgia team and how they've been able to play well consistently. Didn't play well that first half against Missouri, but for the most part, they played well. They weren't dominant last week against South Carolina, but they played well, well-coached team, physical team, athletic. Should be a lot of fun. Typical SEC, good defensive matchup. Chris, when you look at the college football playoff rankings and you begin to look at the top teams in college football, I, I don't know, I, I'm curious if you see any teams because it seems like everybody has flaws. Alabama, Georgia, Notre Dame, Clemson, Oklahoma, they all have little weaknesses that they can work on. Do you see a dominant team in, in college football? And how would you look at them? I don't see dominance, but I think that there's a drop-off. For example, I'm going to start from outside the top four, and I see Oklahoma's problems on defense. I think that offensively, they, with Baker Mayfield, they can cause a lot of problems for a lot of people, but defensively, people can run the football on them, shorten the game. TCU doesn't protect the football enough on offense. Miami, I think, is overrated, and I think they'll get beaten by a significant margin by Notre Dame. Wisconsin's a very solid, not real explosive, very limited in big plays. Auburn, we talked a little bit about them, but but again, I think they're, they've got some limitations. Uh, and then even you get into the USC's and the Michigan States and Ohio States, they're, they're not good enough for their own reasons. So you get into Clemson. Clemson is a very athletic team defensively. Uh, I, I don't think that they are a as good in the passing game, nearly as good in the passing game as they were last year. So I don't know there is there is balance. Notre Dame, can they throw the football well enough with Wimbush? That's a key. Very good offensive line. In fact, it's been the top-graded offensive line for me 
this year in the country, and Harry Hindstead, the offensive line coach, is one of the best in the business. So uh, I think that uh, they're very good. Dominant, I'd probably stay away from that. Georgia, again, we talked about them. Very good team. Very good defensively. Very athletic. Um, the Probably as good or deep a running back group as there is in the country and is very, very good and, and, and from as a guy that can make plays. However, is can he make enough plays? And if you get pressure in the pocket, you know, can he avoid pressure? And can he continue to make plays if you slow down the run game? That's the issue. So I wonder when I look at a Georgia and say, well, wait a minute, how would he fare up against a great defense? And how could they, if they can't run the football, can they make plays? That's where I'm concerned a little bit about with Georgia. The, the best team that I see that can answer the most questions is Alabama. Uh, we're dealing with they're dealing with the injuries right now. We know that's an issue. Uh, it's very difficult to run the football on them. They do a great job with pattern matching, so it's difficult to make a lot of sustained plays in the passing game. And it's usually underneath, and it's it's a uh, it's very difficult to score a lot. You can make some plays, but getting the ball in the end zone very very difficult against this team. Alabama can run the football very well. Um, it's it's they will stay committed to the run. And so that allows them to have success as they're able to kind of wear teams out. The other thing is they've got a quarterback that's very athletic, that's very capable of beating you as a runner, and great with play extensions, one, and what I would call play-making ability when things break down. Uh, he, can make, he can turn a mess into a big-time play for you. That's something that maybe a Wimbush can do, but to not the consistency that Jalen Hurts can do. The other thing that I don't think people are seeing that I see is that I think Alabama is a little more dangerous in the passing game than people think. Now, the passing game involves a lot of things. I mentioned last week they dropped too many balls. There were some balls on third downs in particular that Jalen Hurts threw it is about it. You couldn't place it any better. you got to catch it. you got to make a play. And they made some plays. They made enough plays to win, win by double, by two touchdowns against LSU. But you make those plays, that game might be a, again, that might be a 24-point win instead of a 14-point win. Now, what is that going to mean in a big-time game? Well, I think I'm more confident right now in their ability to make plays in the passing game if they can catch the football a little bit better. And I think in traffic is has been the biggest issue that I see, concentration. Um, but I, I see a confidence in Jalen Hurts and a development in his ability to throw the football when he has to that's better than most people think. It's just that the results are not there. The yards are not there. But if you are trained to study film, you see the improvement. I, I do. But the passing game constitutes your ability to get open and catch the football and make plays, and that part of it hasn't been as good. And there are still plays that are left out on the field that Jalen doesn't make, but I think he makes enough of them. Uh, And I would say, outside of Baker Mayfield, there's not a quarterback that I'll sit there and say, hey, that guy's going to get it done. Sam Darnold, with all of his mistakes, can make big-time plays. He makes a lot of mistakes, but there are not a lot of guys that you can hang your hat on and say, hey, that quarterback's going to take it to the – to the promised land, and the rest of that team is just not good enough. They don't have enough of a defense. So I think people are flawed. I absolutely do. But I think Alabama's got the most answers uh, if they can get over this injury situation and uh, and sustain it through the rest of this month and get some of these guys back for the playoffs. Well, Chris, let me, let me say this about Alabama. In, in doing a show in Tuscaloosa where we're a caller-friendly show, we have a lot of interaction on Twitter, we, we take a lot of phone calls, I think last year, because of the loss to Clemson in the national championship game, this fan base, uh, me included in the media side of things, is a little oversensitive. We put everything under a microscope because you lost in a championship game, and certainly you don't want that to happen again. I think that's why uh, this fan base is a little oversensitive uh, to maybe, you know, when, when a flaw happens, it's like it's, you know, it's magnified uh, because Alabama fans have been through a rough, what, eight, nine, ten months here. Uh, after losing the championship game. Well, and listen, rightly so. That's exactly the way the head coach looks at it, too. You know, we're not that good, and we need to get better. And there is that challenge. And thereby, somebody asked me the other day, um, 
somewhere else. I think it was nationally on NBC. I'm not quite sure exactly. I do a bunch of these, but um, you know, uh, it was something along the line is who's the best team in the country, and you know, the answer is Alabama. Well, how good are they? I'm like, well, oh, they're very, they're very good. And then the next question was, well, well, how does it compare to some of the great teams he's had? Well, like, well, they're not playing those teams. I mean, they're not. I don't know that I'm ready to put them in a class of this or that. Um, but you know, to me, compared up against other teams, I think they match up very well. It is completely understandable when it's win the national championship or disappointment um, is the answer. I can't guarantee anybody that they're going to win the national championship. Far from it. Anything can happen. But I do think that, you know, hopefully I've explained a little bit at least how I see it as to where they've got a little bit more of an edge in some areas, maybe not a decisive edge in, in against certain matchups, but um, I think they fare pretty well against most people in terms of their preparation, certainly, but in terms of what they can bring out there. Now, injuries have a way to start to, to cut into that a little bit if they're no longer a dominant defense and they have to, you know, you know, it, it, to score a lot. And they, if they have to be a team, look, if they were lining up and they had to play Oklahoma's game and play Oklahoma and go up and down the field and throw the football, that's not a game that they're going to win. Okay, but that's not a game that they allow themselves to get into. They'll control the football. They'll run the football. They'll take the air out of the clock a little bit, and they they will keep Oklahoma's offense off the field. Just as a for example, uh, and I don't see Oklahoma really making it into the playoffs. But my point is, is um, if you're looking for a guarantee, you you're not going to get it from me because I've been around this too long. I'll just say it's a pretty good team. I think it's uh, it's better than maybe people might think. I think people are hearing a lot of the negatively. Well, they don't play anybody. Well, listen, it, it, you can look at it, and if you watch Alabama play, for example, as I do, and study them on tape, and I look at Wisconsin and study them on tape, there's a decidable difference between the two, even though, quote-unquote, their schedules haven't been very difficult. Well, the SEC is not as deep as it has been in the past, but who is? I mean, is the Big Ten all that good? I mean, the Big 12? I mean, the Pac-12? I mean, the ACC outside of Clemson? Who's good? If you break it down, not trying to be glass half, glass half empty, but nobody's good. You know, Georgia and Alabama, at least, are national playoff caliber. That's, you know, one more team than any other conference has that are their national playoff caliber. So I think some of the teams that they've played – are a little bit better than people give credit, and they've dominated them. Um, I think that accounts for something, but I'm not going to succeed in being able to convince somebody that that's concerned that you shouldn't be concerned because you should be. There are issues, but I think their issues are uh, in better position to be handled in a positive vein than maybe some of these other teams. Everybody's got issues, as you said earlier. Chris, let me throw it back to you and talk about the website. Certainly, uh, I've talked about it. Uh, encourage fans to go there. If you want to go deeper in college football, invite the folks to your website. Well, LandryFootball.com is where you, we take you inside the film room. We break down the college game, the pro game, uh, from recruiting, draft prospects, just breaking down college players as a whole. If it involves evaluating players, teams, coaches, schemes on the college level, the NFL level, that's what we do for you. So check us out. A lot of free information, a podcast every Tuesday and Thursday. You don't want to miss that. Um, check us out. If you like football, you'll love LandryFootball.com. LandryFootball.com. Chris, thank you again for being a part of the show. Thank you, and I'll hey, talk to you next Wednesday. Thank you so much. Take care. Absolutely. Chris Landry. Uh